I'm Jasmine Moradi, and you're listening to the Queens of Tech podcast, a podcast series about raising the voice of workplace champions. 60 plus questions in around 30 to 40 minutes with women, women of color, non-binary, and transgender influencers about their journey into STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. I started the Queens of Tech podcast initiative in May 2022 because I would like to retain more women, women of color, non-binary, and transgenders in the tech industry. Talent is out there, but our work environment needs to improve for all to feel safer, stay authentic, and to be valued for our contributions. My vision is to raise the workplace ecosystem for all in tech by killing the imposter syndrome, stopping bad behavior, and increasing equity opportunities. Each podcast talk is built around 60 plus questions regarding upbringing, education, career path, DIB, and future advice. My mission is to bridge a gap between schools and workplaces by getting into the heart of my guest's personal life and career journey to inspire other girls, women, women of color, non-binary, and transgenders to unleash the full potential to reach top leadership roles in the tech industry. My goal is to raise the voices of tech champions around the world and together with companies, investors, and politicians raise the challenges and opportunities around equity, inclusive, diversity, and belonging in our workplaces. Enough is enough. I would like to enforce companies to build a sustainable, inclusive culture to retain diverse talent so we keep the workforce power equity to continue building future diverse and inclusive products. Representation matters. Your voice matters. In this episode, I'm very excited to welcome my guest, Tech Queen Lauren Carries, Senior Product Strategy, Delivery and Learning Design Consultant at Coding Scape. Hi, Lauren. Very Hello. excited to be here. Well, I'm very happy to have you joining us all the way from the U.S. How are you today? Doing really well. Enjoying the last bit of summer here. Glad to hear. Now, let us dive into your journey into STEM. Let's get to know you. So hope you're ready for the quiz of take 60 plus questions. Awesome. Let's go. Let's warm up with a few fun facts about you. How would you describe your personality in three hashtags? Enthusiastic, authentic, genuine. How would you describe your life in three sentences? My life is dynamic. I live my life in a shared experience with others. And I think it is evolving and nonlinear. What kind of music stimulates and motivates you the most? I love dance music, hip hop. And then I do appreciate instrumental kind of like binaural beats and just quiet. What is your favorite book? Empathy Advantage. It is written by Heather McGowan. And it is really inspiring to think about the future of work and the future of leadership from a superpower perspective. So I love her work. I love the book in terms of the provocative questions that it asks leaders. And I think anyone in business that is curious and serious about designing employee experiences and the role that empathy plays in that. What is your favorite podcast? I'm a big fan of Lenny's podcast. It's a product-based podcast. And I think he does such a wonderful job of asking questions, expressing interest and engagement and the patterns that he is able to both demonstrate in the podcast, but also insights he's able to elicit. I think have helped him reach such a following. I'm super inspired by it. Mac or PC? Mac. There's something interesting about you that most people don't know. I grew up in a very religiously diverse household and it exposed me to thinking about patterns 
in language and patterns in spirituality that is quite unique from others. What is your hidden talent? I don't know that it's hidden, but it's a talent that I didn't really think about much growing up. And it would be the role that emotion and empathy plays in leadership. I, as a young person, really knew that I was an emotionally sensitive person, but I didn't realize the opportunity or the potential to hone emotion and hone sensitivity in a productive insightful way that can really lead to inspiring leadership. And yeah, I didn't realize as a young person how I could really use emotion and sensitivity to emotion in really beneficial ways in the world of work. And if you were to write a book about your life, what would a title be? It would definitely be a gerund, something like emerging or I love you know, Michelle Obama's book on becoming, it would definitely be a title that is reflective of continuous growth and evolution. Great start, Laura. Now, let us dig deeper. Our childhood has an effect on our attitude. Our early experiences shape our belief about ourselves, others, and the world. Now, I want to discover your childhood. Where did you grow up and how did it shape your early experiences? I was born and raised in Southern California in San Diego, and I grew up for part of my childhood in San Diego and then part of my childhood in the Imperial Valley, which is a desert agricultural community east of San Diego, just north of the U.S.-Mexico border and just west of the Arizona-California border. So this agricultural community, but also a lot of exposure to and constant visiting to San Diego, I think to me really shaped an experience of duality and an experience of multiplicity and an experience that was really not monolithic, but quite dynamic. So constantly, I think I also alluded to growing up in a religiously dynamic household the idea of that we can have plural selves, like multiple selves in different social settings, the idea that we can have this and, the idea that we can speak multiple languages that reflect different experiences when you're speaking one or another language, even if it's a dialect. So I think that had an impact on my interest in diversity and I think this idea of multiplicities. What was your dream job when you were a child? Being an astronaut. I think just the idea of there being something different, quote unquote, out there. The idea of there being more was really important to me growing up. What was your favorite subject in school? I was a really good student and really liked learning. So I liked a lot of subjects. But I think when I took an advanced psychology class in high school, It was fascinating. And it was one of the first times that I got to see social science in action. Everything else was always so categorized as like history or literature, but it was the first time that like a more dynamic and interdisciplinary approach. What would you say was the least favorite subject then? Math and not just general math, but I really struggled with calculus. That was really hard. That was a pain. What would you say is your earliest memory of technology and the arrival of the internet? Born in 1979, I feel like most of my memory was the evolution of technology. I don't remember the moment of the arrival of the internet, but I remember I felt very privileged to have a word processor at home in middle school and the first part of high school and felt quite privileged to have a really old desktop computer. I felt very envious of the really early Mac models and you know individuals who were able to access those Mac computers as giant as they were. But yeah, I was a child of the, you know, floppy disk and Oregon Trail and It was in early college that AOL chat rooms were coming about. And so digital recording devices, you know, as a kid, I have lots of tapes from video recording or recording devices. My mom really liked photography. So tons of different types of film that weren't quite digitized yet. But these were my experiences of technology and transition. 
And then which were then the three first technology gadgets you owned yourself? And how did they influence your interest in tech going forward? I don't remember the earliest gadgets, but core memories were wireless telephones. It was still plugged into the wall, but it was wireless and you could kind of like walk around your room with it. That felt so, I don't know, it was such a mark of independence. And of course, it was still a landline. So I still had to share it with the rest of the family. And you had all of the three-way calling or group phone calls and other people picking up the phone and listening in on your conversation. Um, Another core technology memory were back to digital cameras and that evolution from film to digital cameras that was really momentous, I remember. And the CD player and the CD-ROM. So getting stereo in my bedroom in high school was such a mark of independence and like youth kind of resistance and being able to go to the record store and look at LPs and CD-ROMs and, you know, the artwork on CDs was you had a little bit more space than a, a cassette tape. So artwork and the design of artwork and the role of music and digital music really coming about. And shortly after that, then things like Napster and sort of stealing music, but then the transformation towards digital recording and digital mixing along with taking a tape and recording directly from the radio, from my favorite DJs and being able to kind of mix in different songs from CDs that was digital mixing early days. And then during that period of time, who was your female role model growing up and what about her inspired you? My mom was definitely my greatest female role model. She was the first to go to college from her family. She didn't go away to college. She stayed at home, but she was the first to go. I remember being so inspired by her leadership style and the way that she inspired students. She was an educator, but also inspired other educators. She was really transformational and inspiring. And based on what you said about your childhood, how do you think where you grew up and the school you went to and the generation you come from influenced your education and career choice? Well, it influenced a lot. I didn't really ever think about or consider technology to be a technologist, an actual career path. I think growing up in a sort of rural agricultural community, there were a lot more traditional career choices and career paths you were exposed to. It was either the big power roles like doctor, lawyer, and then there were helper roles like teacher. And I definitely found myself in more of a helper role, did not knowing that you could be a power helper role going forward. But I have definitely found that to be my career path and trying to merge the two. Um, I think because of the socioeconomic status of the community that I grew up in, it was really important to me to align myself with more Ivy League isn't right because I didn't go to an Ivy League school, but affluent maybe or just high profile academic experiences. It was really important to me to go away to college, to go to a well-known university and being part of the UC system. And that sort of labeling was really, really important and definitely influenced the way that I saw advancement and achievement to be a marker of my own growth. Thank you for sharing that, Lauren. I see it makes you very passionate and emotional. Dig into your career, but before that, I'm going to read two quotes. First one, how does the universe expect me to choose a career path at 16? Or can't even choose what I want for dinner? Second, Abraham Lincoln said, I quote, the best way to predict your future is to create it. So Lauren, where and what did you end up studying at university then? Super interesting quotes. I could talk about those for um, an entire podcast. But I studied anthropology and Spanish. It was really important to me and interesting and inspiring to, like I mentioned earlier, social sciences and being able to merge science and math, even pattern recognition and the social experience. When I discovered anthropology, it was just such a game changer. Um, Being able to understand the self in relation to your social context and how that relates over time. And it was just fascinating to me. So 
Anthropology was my chosen field, being interested in language and double majoring in Spanish. The university I went to did not have linguistic anthropology as a subfield. I didn't even know about it, but I merged the two of them out of my own interest and then later in graduate school found that niche and that opportunity. During your road towards that, who and what influenced you to get into your choice in field? I had a female professor who was absolutely beautiful. She was a former beauty pageant queen. So her beauty was not just superficial, but she knew also how to connect and engage with her classroom. And I say that because that's a lot of what the beauty pageant experience, like really being able to be authentic, I think was, you know, really important. And she was so inspiring. She supported me to actually kick off the inaugural academic club for anthropology. And she was such an inspiration in promoting leadership in academia. And it was incredible. Plus, she wasn't that much older than me. She was just kind of like an academic powerhouse. So she seemed very young and accessible. And we stay connected. We send each other Christmas cards still. She was super inspiring at that time. She was also Latina. And I think that was played a really big role. So being a self-identified Latina and seeing another Latina leader in the quote unquote classroom, but also in academia and in a power role was just super inspiring. And what professional roles have you had before that led you to the current one? I'll try to give you the quick summary, but academia played a really, really big role in achievement in my sense of self and my sense of personal growth. And so I pursued a PhD, got several accolades and rewards for my research and my writing, and always was really inspired by students. And so I was teaching for a long time during graduate school, throughout graduate school, looking at developing curriculum, engaging with students, integrating technology into the learning experience. And in retrospect, it all makes sense. But in the moment, it felt like my experiences and my interests were all really distributed and like I was just sort of reaching for whatever made sense or whatever was next. So a lot of teaching and learning design as an educator that then led way into curriculum development at scale, digital learning experience design, and now eventually into product leadership specifically for career planning and career development. I'm really interested in that intersection of a career, of technology, of the future of work and the future of learning. And today you work at Codingscape. So what does Codingscape do? Codingscape is a software development agency. We support different companies and clients to get their technology roadmaps over the line with expert talent and solution design and help with the actual coding and delivery of those solutions. Fun fact, I used to be Codingscape's client. They helped me get my project over the line and every one of the team members that I was overseeing in that project at my company ended up getting a promotion and developing along their career path as a result of that partnership and that project. I will take credit and responsibility for their advancement because I did a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of shaping, aligning, making hard decisions, being available for the technology team and leading that product towards the success that we had. And so when I was eventually laid off during, you know, as many folks in tech experienced, really disruptive experience, Codingscape and the leadership team there became my sponsors. They supported and sponsored my attendance at a couple of conferences, engagement and conversations with them, and offered me the opportunity to pitch a solution to them. At the time, they were really focused on designing a plan to support their senior team members, most of them engineers, a couple of designers, several product folks in mapping out their own career trajectories and maintaining engagement and development as they as a company grew. And so I pitched a solution to them, ended up getting a, a full-time gig with it, and then balancing that project along with other product leadership work that I've been able to do. So it was a really nice partnership. And I share the sponsorship piece. It's really important because a lot of times we talk about mentorship, we talk about advocates, 
we don't often identify or even know how to truly sponsor professionals, especially women. And I think it's really important that folks know that there are really human-centered, people-centered leaders out there, even in technology, that are truly looking out for the growth, advancement, and development of other women technologists. So what is your title and what is your main responsibilities? On the surface, I'm a senior product leader. And my responsibility in relation to the clients that we serve has evolved a little bit now to also be a senior product strategist. So I work with different technology leaders, depending on the scope of the project, to help with a little bit of research and discovery, help them identify where is their technology in relation to the goals that they have and how do we build not just a product roadmap, but also a tech roadmap to help achieve those goals. What will it look like in terms of scope, in terms of team assignments, in terms of value-driven feature evolution? And so some of these are projects for teams, for companies internally. Some of them are customer-facing products. And so really my sweet spot is around product strategy, product design, product delivery. But along with that is the learning design piece. And so you see in my title, learning designer, a lot of that comes from this long history in higher education and also professional learning and development and being able to interweave those. So some of my favorite domains and project areas are those that deal with career mapping, career planning, skills development, whether it's education technology or human resource information systems. I see ed tech as a really broad and diverse group, even though some think it's super niche, but truly you can apply all of that learning and behavioral psychology to user experience and user behaviors. And so I do a lot of crossover and pattern seeking from those domains into the services and the solutions that we provide to companies. Very interesting. So what does a typical workday or work week look like for you then? Well, I pride myself in working with a team that truly defines people-centered, remote-first work. I spend most of my time on either Zoom or Slack or Google Meets meetings, interfacing with team members, you know, simultaneously documenting with my own notes, using a lot of AI note-taking tools to capture insights and patterns, spin those up and turn them around into something that is understandable to stakeholders and helping to influence with prioritization and reprioritization. I'll share a quick little um, anecdote. My 15-year-old son was hanging out in my office and he was just working on some artwork. And later in the afternoon, he was sharing with my 11-year-old daughter his observations of me in work. And he shared that, Sophie, mom is, he used the term goaded, like really good at her job. She can anticipate what other people are thinking and play it back to them in words that make them feel really good about the solution, what they're trying to do. And I thought it was such an interesting observation because I didn't ask for that feedback, but he was just picking up on it. So I really love working with digital whiteboards and using images and going back to my early studies in anthropology and even applied linguistics, how we use symbols and signs and sign systems to align and create new shared meaning and shared understanding. So I spend a lot of time in digital whiteboards, just collecting insights and sharing insights back with folks. Choose a job you love, Lauren, and you will never have to work a day in your life. You did mention a little bit, but what do you exactly love the most about your role? Turning insights into action, delighting stakeholders with improved user experience and improved front-end design. And really, I truly love translating requirements and translating concepts from non-technical team members to technical developers and vice versa. Even when you have a technical stakeholder or CEO, oftentimes there's still some level of translation that's required in order to execute or communicate reprioritization or emphasize where value is being delivered. And that is truly part of the work that I love. Then can you share with us an example of what has been the best experience you've had in your career role so far? I really pride myself on 
supporting teams, it's all a team effort, um, supporting teams to get our work done ahead of schedule, under budget, and with added delight. And so I spend a lot of time with mobile projects. And so either translating from a web experience into a mobile experience or starting a new mobile experience off the bat and just being able to delight stakeholders when they get, whether it's through test flight or whether it's the actual launch through an Apple store or Google Play store, when stakeholders are able to see something come alive in their hands right? So the technology feels like it's theirs because it's in their hand, right? You're not just showing a deck. You're actually showing it live and being able to make some of those adjustments, even if there's a mistake or something didn't turn out the way intended it to, being able to push those live updates and really show incremental value. It's such a thrill. It's so awesome. I've worked with so many different tech teams, some that wait until the very end to launch and it's like a big reveal, some that are a little bit more incremental and being able to show continuous delivery. And I think as a consultancy, That's really important for us is to get that early delivery and incremental delivery out regularly. And it's just super fun to see stakeholders light up because now it's real, right? Their goals and their requests are becoming real. That's really awesome. And along the path to be able to reach that, there are a couple of challenges. So what is the biggest challenge you've encountered so far and how did you end up tackling it? Some of the biggest challenges are actually in project readiness. And this is something that we are tackling every day at Codingscape. I think the teams that I work with and the projects that I've worked on, you know, again, going back to pattern recognition and being able to see if this is a pattern for all of these projects, what can we do then to anticipate that this might be a pattern for other projects that come up? And how can we create better checklists or better readiness indicators or better support for our clients or our projects to get ready? So rather than being grumpy and complaining, all of these clients are ill-prepared, um, really taking ownership in partnership with the teams that I work with. Like, what are the requirements that we need? And what are the questions maybe we should be asking to help us evaluate that readiness? Then what timeline might we need if they are not ready, right? So a lot of the decision trees and decision making that is pretty typical in software development, just kind of reinforcing that at an earlier stage with a slightly different lens in order to evaluate readiness, potential, like when might delivery happen, et cetera. Finding that tackling those challenges early on is helping us even identify new quote unquote products, right? Service products. So being able not just to deliver solutions, but also offer to companies or founders or stakeholders who might be struggling with like, where do I even go from here? productizing that research and discovery and that strategic piece ahead of time before delivery is now becoming an area and a domain that I'm really excited about leading. What do you wish everybody understood about your role? I think because the nature of product leaders and maybe product leaders like me, our work is less hyper-focused than developers. Right. I work really hard to make sure our developers know exactly what they need to do so that they can just heads down with no distractions work on it. But the nature of my work is really distributed and chaotic and dynamic and all the things I love. It's not a complaint, but I think oftentimes our developers, when they're coming to ask for support or when they have a question, I'm juggling literally 20 other things on my plate. They know it pretty well, but I think it's just one of those workplace things where everyone operates from the view of their own work, right? And so how I mitigate that is I anticipate the questions that might come up from folks. I anticipate the things that people might need and try my best to be 10 steps ahead, give everyone what they need, let them know what my schedule is like. Let them know when I'm going to have some focused downtime, block my calendar off just for like office hours or working sessions. That's how I try to mitigate it and stay ahead so that others can be a little bit more empathetic to just juggling a lot of different stakeholders, a lot of different information. 
And what would you say is the one common myth about your professional field that you want to disapprove? Oh, for folks that are not quite familiar with product leadership, there's the misconception that it is, quote, just project management. And so I think the acronyms get conflated a little bit, right? So PM is a PM that could be a project or a product manager. And there's definitely some overlap, but they are quite different roles. And so even at Codingscape, exploring how do we detail and parse out the strengths of these two domains for different types of projects. Not every project needs both of them in equal capacity. Not every partnership or client that we have needs the skill set of both of them. I can do both really well, but the same is not true for project leaders moving into product. And so I think there's a lot of confusion and assumptions around that, especially when it comes to executing on value-driven product enhancement, an assumption that well, I already did all of the prioritization, so just execute on this. Leaving out the context could be super dangerous, right? So clearly I'm a context person. I'm really curious about the why. I want to know the big picture and then bring it down to folks. And so some of those misconceptions that you either don't need that context, you just need to hurry up and deliver, can be dangerous. And then similarly, not really understanding the strengths and the value add of these two related but distinct roles in executing product innovation. But what do you love about working exactly in the tech industry? The pace of change. It's fatiguing for a lot of people, but I absolutely love the pace of evolution, of growth, of development. To be an expert in mobile design 15 years ago is not the same as being an expert in mobile design today. And so that requirement to continuously grow and evolve and develop at the same pace as technology is changing, I find super exciting. It's not for everyone, but I find it really exciting. I love being able to come to technology from a social science background, from a human-centered design background, and be able to see patterns and impact and behavior in a very different way from technologists, I find to be super complimentary. And it's where some of the greatest solutions and exciting projects emerge. And Opera Winfrey said, I quote, Think like a queen. A queen is not afraid to fail. Failure is not a stepping stone. Greatness. So Lauren. What has by far been your biggest achievement in your career? Okay, so I'm going to frame this a couple different ways. My biggest achievement, my favorite project was actually a self-discovery and career exploration app. It's a company called Find Your Grind. And it was an opportunity that I learned the most about myself, about what I look for in early stage tech companies, in the kinds of mentorship and leadership that I seek. And it was also my greatest achievement in terms of execution and being able to work with a very small, tight-knit team. It was less than 20 people being able to execute on both UX research, on prioritization frameworks, on content strategy, and on machine learning and developing the technical roadmap to help us achieve really powerful user-centric, learner-centric value was essential. I absolutely loved it. And it was a beautiful app and still is. It's out and it just, it's doing really wonderful things. So I would say that was my greatest technical achievement. My greatest personal and professional achievement was evolving in terms of and learning about what I needed from leaders and learning what I needed in my own career trajectory. It came through lots of leadership development and leadership training. But the moment I really understood the power of career mapping for yourself rather than expecting support from others was transformational. And it took a lot of work, but being able to do that career mapping, career planning, really set goals, look at achievement in different ways, that was a really transformational time. Amazing. Very inspiring. What would you say is the biggest factors help you become the successful? Any success habits you have? Success habits. I would say introspection and reflection. 
I took very seriously these leadership opportunities and the leadership and development trainings that I had where a lot of folks, I think, roll their eyes or get fatigued at it or, you know, don't have the patience to really dive deep. I think it's part of my own personality being authentically and genuinely emotional is for some people really uncomfortable, but it has served me well in being able to be authentic about my own career decisions. And it is not for everyone, but I personally really do find work and career to be a significant part of my own personality and how I define myself. And being okay with that rather than feeling judged for taking it too seriously or rather than feeling like, judging my, you know, balance of other life experiences that can come with a lot. But I think as a woman in the world of work, as a mom in the world of work, you wear a lot of hats and coming to a point, I think of professional maturity to own and accept that it sounds silly, but it doesn't have to be perfect. I love this quote from Tracy Zimmerman. She shared that it's not perhaps about finding balance, but instead about finding your rhythm, I think is so powerful. And so being able to see these like rhythms and cycles of life and your journey and the role that career plays in that, because it may not always, but I think that's really important to me and owning that and tapping into emotion and emotional intelligence and authentic leadership are all really important to me. So how do you measure your own performance at work knowing that you are successful? I'll go back to introspection and reflection a lot. As a career insight tech leader, I have developed both internship, mentorship, and professional development plans and maps for staff, for teams. And so I regularly, after each project that I'm on, self-evaluating am also inviting team members to give me feedback and asking team members and leaders to help me see my own blind spots to think about, you know, what we could do to improve an experience or a collaboration or even my own performance. And so in a constant state of evaluation and continuous learning, right? Just like in technology. And with success comes failures. So what is your biggest failure in your career and what did you learn from it? I've had many failures, so I don't know the, the biggest, but the biggest I can remember right now, um, most recently, I was laid off. And I think that on the one hand, just a layoff can feel like a failure. It was such a learning experience. And we can also say a layoff is not your own fault. You know, there's no reason for you to think that. But I think my mindset at the moment of that layoff is something that I've learned a lot from the dependency on one employer versus thinking about your own, you know, value add to the field, to the industry, apart from one employer, um, thinking about financial health and financial success outside of the dependency of an employer. Those are all really big lessons that I have learned that have been hard to learn. And that, frankly, I don't think a lot of young people are prepared to manage. We have a lot of false narratives around employment, around professional success, around career trajectories that truly all hinge on some misconceptions around financial health and wellness. And the sooner we can help ourselves and future generations understand even financial success diversity might look like, right, for ourselves is really important, especially in this moment where tech is super disruptive, where financial models are really disruptive, where companies and their own financial success are really dynamic and unpredictable. I think it's more and more important for us to learn about how to be financially well and healthy apart from the dependency on an employer. Well said. I, I do agree with that. Very good to, to highlight that. And you've mentioned to me that you love your field, you love your role, and you love technology. But overall, Lauren, what is inspiring and motivates you the most in your role and career right now? What motivates me the most is the opportunity to be a different kind of leader and to be a different kind of technologist. I do not fit 
the model of a lot of others. And I don't really care to. I feel really confident in that. And I think that's really inspiring being able, like I said, to be an untrained technologist. I didn't get an undergraduate in computer science. I didn't get an MBA in product leadership. I came out of an experience, you know, rooted in social sciences and rooted in user behaviors and really understanding value and identity. And I think that is such an interesting complement to the world of technology and the world of tech leadership that I am inspired to continue to just like infuse this different perspective. I've found it personally rewarding. I think that my team members and stakeholders that do give feedback, that they really love working with me. I do think it's a part of that because I'm not like your typical technology or product leader. Because you're the face of the new technology leader of the future. Mm, maybe. Yeah. Let us now jump into the influence of mentor, role models, champions, and sponsors. You did talk about how you got your recent job. It was your sponsorship and the importance of it. Mm -hmm. And role models can consciously or subconsciously be a perfect force in our lives. In addition, champions can stand up and advocate for us and open up the world of possibilities. Sponsors match emerging talent with leaders and influential employees who can help us move ahead in our careers. So, Laura, do you have a mentor, champion, or a sponsor today? I sure do. I have a couple. One of them is Jimmy Jacobson, who I mentioned, who is one of the co-founders and CEOs of Codingscape. He has been an incredible champion and partner, again, back when I was the client and we were working together, being able to ask questions about tech leadership and be inspired by his people first, human centric approach to technology work is super important and interesting. So I really admire his leadership and appreciate his sponsorship and the fact that I get to work with him every day. Um, another maybe inspiration, and it's a little premature for me to call her a sponsor, but I'm going to go ahead and do it, put it out in the universe. Um, Jennifer Moore, she is a chief product leader, and I have the good fortune of being able to work with her in a mentor-mentee experience. I have served as a mentor for so many different tech initiatives and this year for the first time applied to be a mentee and I got paired with Jennifer. I am so excited to be working by her side and really get an important dose of female mentorship from another product leader and really excited about the way that she leads. And last Christmas, in fact, I was a recipient of one of her 12 days of Christmas gift on LinkedIn. And I didn't know her before, but we were just engaging. And here we are today working together as a really great mentor-mentee partnership. Um, really excited about, about her role in my career also. Amazing. What an inspiring and um, successful sponsorship uh, stories. And history shows that it has been more common for men having mentors, champions, and sponsor in business than women. And you are successfully telling your stories to us. How important do you think is to have a mentor, champion, and sponsor through one's career? It is essential. And I think we do ourselves a disservice by asking for women to name mentors and inspiration as if it was a one-time thing. It's just like um, the question of what do you want to be when you grow up? And it's not a super useful question. It's great to reflect on and think of that person, but it's different from an active engagement in seeking current and future and lifelong or career-long mentors and sponsors. And I think that you know, again, it's super common for us to identify someone from the past or who was the mentor at this time or who was the inspiration at this time. But we have a long way to go in cultivating sustainable partnerships that will serve in that, you know, mentorship and sponsorship capacity going forward. And now let's move forward to another topic, and that is leadership, a subject that you love and have a lot of knowledge in. I will start with two quotes. Adena Friedman, president and CEO of Nasdaq, said, I quote, empowering those around you to be heard and valued makes a difference between a leader who simply instructs and one who inspires. And Shirley Sandberg, ex-CEO of Facebook, said, I quote, leadership is about making others better as a result of presence. 
Leadership is about making others better as a result of your presence and making sure that the impact lasts in your absence. So Laura, what does leadership mean to you? I really resonate with that quote. I think there are a lot of quotes like that, that highlight the fact that leadership isn't about someone in the moment doing something but someone cultivating a culture, an experience, a feeling in their absence. And I really resonate with that. Being able to lead teams and products and organizations to have a different experience is really important to me. Apart from the day-to-day KPIs that you're moving, those will all come when the culture, when the experience is being momentum and energy. And you can't fake that. You can't demand or dictate it. It's something that has to actively be worked on in perfect ways through lots of renegotiation, lots of alignment, lots of act. It's work. And I think there are a lot of leaders, a lot of tech leaders that operate with a very patriarchal leadership approach, one of demand and control and superficial. And I have had the good fortune of working with several leaders who are not of that mindset, fortunately, and seeing the the positive impact that that can have. So that's a very long-winded way of saying that leadership to me really is about inspiring action, inspiring experience, even when the leader is not there, especially when the leader is not there. Then how do you distinguish a good leader from a bad leader? One that inspires change or inspires an experience, even in their absence, for sure. I think good leaders maintain their label of being a good leader long after they have left. I take seriously connecting and maintaining connections with former colleagues from several years ago. And I think It's because of the way that I define leadership and the way that I define even my own personal growth. How do I continue to reflect on and see how things have evolved and changed or stayed the same and how my people are doing, whether they're still at an organization or have evolved from there. And so I really see leadership in that mentorship, coaching, inspiring, you know, transformational way, not as a dictator, not as a patriarchal kind of approaches. Who is your favorite female non-binary or transgender pit leader and why? I mentioned Heather McGowan. She's not necessarily a tech leader, but she is a leader in the world of technology through her approach on leadership and organizational and workforce changes. And I think these are the kinds of leaders that are really going to pave the way for the future, even for those in tech. Um, You know, we over the weekend experienced the passing of a really important tech leader from the Google days. I was just looking at her profile and thinking she literally was the womb of Google. In her garage space, it was birth. And these are the leaders, I think, in tech that we're going to see surfacing over and over. Those women who are advocating for diverse support for women of all walks of life, women who choose to have children, women who don't choose to have children, women who may be mothering children who are not their own. It is just so dynamic. And I think a really important time in our social experience to help define and redefine opportunities for better leadership. I see a lot of my role models in social spaces. Rashma Sajani, who is really advocating for moms who are working. Another great, she may not be considered a tech leader, but Chani Nicholas, she's actually an astrologer and she's the CEO and co-founder of the Chani app. I just adore the technology evolution of the app itself, but even more so appreciate her personal approach to leadership and the ways that she and her partner have defined a place for women to advance personally, professionally, and the benefits that are listed on their website as tech leaders for individuals with wombs, right? The language that they use that is so inclusive and being able to see tech leaders who are really concerned with mental health, with personal finance, with giving a fair and sustainable salary. So based on what you said, Lauren, 
How would you describe yourself as a leader? I've used the term transformational before, but I don't know that that's accurate anymore. Um, and I used to use that in the sense that I like to help individuals and products and experience evolve. But I think I've come to understand myself as more of an inspirational leader. I really love the idea of taking insights and bringing them to action and inspiring team members and stakeholders and those around to continue to maintain the momentum of that work. Um, I think inspirational at the moment is really how I would describe myself. Then as a tech leader, what values do you prioritize the most? I value flexibility and remote first people centric work. At the moment can sound like taglines, but I think to truly be a people centric leader, you are empathizing with individuals, you're anticipating their lives outside of work and how that relates and comes into their work. And so those are really important values because we are humans after all. Um, the technologies that we use to perform our day to day experiences are. They're just tools. And so remembering that we are all humans living in dynamic experiences is really critical. I also value, uh, like I said, flexibility. And so as a mom, I love and appreciate and value the opportunity to go and watch my kids at their performances, be able to take them to doctor's appointments, to be able to also practice my own self-care if I have to in the middle of the day and not be under the thumb of, you know, a nine to five clocking in and clocking out in an office where you're not even being productive anyway, because you're working with people from around the world. So that kind of flexibility is really important to me and being able to build trust through accountability, right? Through communication. And if somebody wants to work on the weekend, because that's going to free up a couple of hours for them during the week when they have to address something personally, why not? So that flexibility, trust, inspiration, being able to grow in your career and in your space and being able to be recognized for that work. Those are all values really essential to me. And on top of that, what leadership lessons have you learned during your journey that have shaped you into the leader you are today? I think boundaries. That's a really important leadership lesson. I think especially for any empathetic leader, there is not a fine line, but it feels when you're in the moment like a fine line between either overexposing yourself and sort of bleeding into work without healthy boundaries. And that's also a lesson, I think, in relationships with your team members. There is a balance and a rhythm to supporting people personally, but also not getting completely wrapped up in their own you know, personal experiences. And so those are leadership lessons that as an empath and as an inspiring leader who really cares about context and really cares about people, um, learning how to navigate and maintain that level of trust, that level of interest, and that level of engagement without losing yourself. What would you say are your three strengths and three weaknesses? Three strengths are empathy, communication, and enthusiasm. I've had several team members um, share that, you know, there are a lot of folks that use all caps and exclamation points and you feel like they're yelling or they're like negative and they shared, I hear the enthusiasm even in Slack or even in a text message because it's authentic when it comes from you. And I think that it's a strength in that it's hard to develop for people who that doesn't come naturally for. But I've found a way to really leverage that as a strength in my work and with my teams. So that's just one. I think a weakness is that because I care so much about context, it can sometimes take up too much space or, you know, kind of honing in like how much, right? So I'm very self-aware of that being a potential weakness and knowing it's a lifelong challenge to adjust and make things shorter, make things, I will never say to care less because I don't think that's accurate, but other people might say care less. Let us now jump into the hottest topic in business today, workplace culture, unlocking the power of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. So Lauren, what do diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging mean to you personally? This has evolved quite a bit in my 
academic studies, diversity and inclusion, I think because of the subject matter that I was working with was really related to identity and language and especially around race and ethnicity. And over time, I think all of those are still really, really important and can also reflect different aspects of our really dynamic identities. But I think inclusive spaces and inclusive technologies, now I really understand also to factor in neurodivergence, diversity of philosophies, diversity of belief systems, belief systems and philosophies, I think are a little bit more challenging. We carry a lot of moral judgments around the ways that people think and the ways that people believe. And I think this is a time where we are challenging ourselves to redefine inclusion and diversity for those aspects as well. Yet, I know that the intersection of race, ethnicity, social class, gender, especially for anyone who self-identifies as intersectional, it's really hard to tease those apart and they, you know, bubble up in different ways. So I think diversity and inclusion are really complex terms that take shape in different contexts and different spaces, depending on a lot of factors. What do you consider being three to five signs of good company culture if you were to join a company tomorrow? Good company culture does not refer to themselves as a family. That's a lesson that I have learned. Another good company culture are healthy boundaries. People step away. People celebrate others stepping away. And folks have diverse and varied engagements with their work. I think for business reasons, it's fine to expect everyone to be full-time, but for cultural reasons, I think it's really important to see a diversity of balance there. You know, some people may need full-time work in this moment. Other people may need part-time or contracted work in this moment because that is just better for their own mental health. And I think that contributes to a more balanced and supportive company culture. I alluded to patriarchy and control before, and I think that I'm learning that my own value system evaluates good company culture as one that also appreciates people's lives outside of work and the demand to be in an office for a set number of hours. If the work does not actually require that, to me, are not signs of good company culture. So good company culture would reflect that balance and respect for the humans doing the work in ways that are matching lifestyles and matching happiness. So good company culture, I think, cares about team members' happiness and is, you know, looking for ways to accommodate and support that while still being a profitable business. And I have seen really good examples of that. So I know it's true and possible. And as a woman, Lauren, what has been the most significant political and cultural barrier in your career and how have you overcome these challenges? mothering and motherhood. I think it is highly politicized, even for women who choose not to have children. It becomes a divisive subject in the world of work. There are a lot of assumptions, you know, oh, well, since so-and-so doesn't have kids, then they should take on more work. Also not true. I also see uh, the really dangerous double standard for men who care for their children to be celebrated when they have a child on their lap in a Zoom meeting or have to leave to go pick up their child from daycare while women are not celebrated. They are seen as incapable of meeting their duties. And so I think motherhood in the many dynamic ways even for women who choose not to, or for whatever reason cannot, right? Whether it's physiological or financial or whatever it may be, it becomes a really challenging and politicized subject that for some reason we feel like is not related to work. And it absolutely is. So I think it's a really powerful topic we could have a whole podcast on. Based on what you said, why do you think it is important for more women, women of color, non-binary and transgenders to join the tech industry today? This I get really excited about because technology intersects with everything we do today. 
I don't care what field you are in. I don't care what identity you have. Someone in any space is interacting with some form of technology. And the more we can infuse the design, the experience, the solutions, the delight from diverse experiences, I think the better we will be as a society. When there is a small subset of individuals who are sometimes without even wanting to left to define experiences in technology, let's take social media, for example, it can be very, very dangerous and influence the ways that we continue to evolve as a society. And so the more diverse individuals who are brought in to work in diverse aspects of technology, STEM in general, I think the better because we will be able to identify and create solutions for the broader good rather than a small subset that may only be looking to make money fast. And I hear that you're very passionate about this subject. So how do you discuss about the EIB challenges such as salary gaps, promotion, maternity leave, etc., with your colleagues, peers, and community? I participate in several um, DEI communities and advocacy groups. I involve myself in women in leadership on behalf of Silicon Slopes and developing and participating in the mentorship program there. I actively engage as part of my own domain expertise in creating pathways and career advancement opportunities and comparing tools that are out there to help us with that, but also in developing programs like internship programs and development plans for individuals. So to ask how I talk about these things, I talk about them passionately. I talk about them in terms of goals and in terms of evolving from the status quo. And I connect myself with other individuals who are really leading both the future of work and the future of learning in these contexts to continuously bring them into not just the technology spaces, but also into organizational leadership and also in the development and evolution of tools that are available for folks. And today there are more women in the tech industry. If you look back to when you and I grew up, Mm -hmm. And there are many public and internal discussions about the barriers that women, women of color, non-binary and transgender individuals face from reaching higher positions or even receiving funding in the tech industry. Yeah. How have these issues affected you and what is your advice or, and what is your advice on overcoming these roadblocks? I don't know that I have advice on overcoming the roadblocks other than sponsoring, supporting and leading more women and individuals of diverse backgrounds into executive tech roles. We see the numbers just like with the Olympics. We're so excited about gender parity, but it's actually just under 50%. It's not quite equal. And the same thing happens in tech and the same thing happens in executive roles. And as you mentioned, in terms of funding, there's the illusion of improvement. Yes, more women are working than ever before, but far fewer women are executives. Far fewer women are actually securing a VC capital and VC funding. Those are the numbers that matter and that need to change before we will see a lot of the impact I think that's expected with quote unquote more women leadership. You can have a bunch of women who are managers and couch that as women leadership. It's such an embarrassing statistic that I think a lot of technology companies like to boast about, or we are a women-centric technology company just hiring a bunch of women in really junior roles. That's not actually getting us there. So to say that we can't find the leaders is a bunch of baloney. To say that we can't find these executives is also a bunch of baloney. Why not start building up that capacity internally then? And there are women out there. You're just not looking hard enough. And the same goes to poor women of diverse backgrounds, women of diverse identities. We are out there. We can be found and supported. It's an easy scapegoat statement to say, quote, we can't find that great talent. That means you're not looking hard enough or you're not committed to actually developing it internally, which is sadly a lot more of the truth than we like to realize. Definitely a bad excuse, as I say, because today tech companies do invest heavily in marketing. 
attracting women in, women of color, non-binary and transgender individuals. But they're saying at the same time that they're struggling to retain them. Because the articles show that women are leaving the tech industry. What is your best advice of strategies for companies can work to build a strong proper culture that engages the IB? The strategies have to be met with the actual desire to support that diversity. And it goes back to, like I was saying before, to assume that everyone needs to be nine to five in an office and then say, we can't find women leaders and then say, well, everyone's leaving. So we might as well just like shift our strategy. Those are all different related but different issues, right? And so what is that saying about your culture? That's saying that you are prioritizing micromanaging because somebody needs to be in there at a specific time. That does not fit necessarily with the evolving social requirements of women in the workplace. Women are also expected to pick up their kids, handle household items, manage their own self-care and mental health, lead teams, be financially secure, right? The evolving demands for women in these spaces are not met oftentimes with the culture or the very narrow description of advancement and career success. And so I think it's going to take a real awakening of companies to redefine their culture, to reset their values. And as we are seeing with the next generation of employees, that value system may not be matching those companies better really consider then what is the value system that they are creating that they are maybe compromising, right, with some of these other kinds of decisions. Because I think more and more we're realizing and being able to read truth and transparency. If you have these quote unquote company values listed on your wall, yet you treat people this way, yet you demand these things, yet you only hire men at the most senior and executive levels who are getting all of the executive coaching not available to any other rising women talent, that is a very explicit narrative to your employees. And so that is bigger than the culture statement that you have on your website. That is bigger than the words that are coming out of your executive's mouth. And so the culture war, so to speak, in organizations, I think is at a moment where as it should be, more employees are taking a look at what is consistent and is consistent, what is consistent and inconsistent, and what does that mean for me? What would you say are the key challenges of implementing a DIB culture in the workplace and this tech industry today? I think the key challenges are getting around the terminology. Sadly, at this moment, the second you say diversity, inclusion, and belonging, people turn away, either because they fear that they cannot make a strong statement around it and will be ridiculed, either because they are uncomfortable with learning about the own limits of their understanding with it, or are uncomfortable because it may be challenging the status quo and the level of security and comfort that they might be experiencing at the top. And so I think it's the terminology itself is super powerful right now and triggering and polarizing and politicized. And it's not helping us get to the root of these you know, decisions that need to be made. Other folks see it as insignificant related to, quote unquote, the bottom line. And that's just because they're not looking deep enough. They're seeing the superficial value of it and quickly writing it off so that they don't have to deal with it in order to generate more revenue in the short term and not really seeing the long term impact. And you did mention that companies see managers as leaders, but they're not really are as managers. So how do you think companies would benefit from not just having women, women of color, non-binary and transgender leaders, but actually higher gender representation at C-suite level and boardrooms with a voice? I think companies would benefit from, first of all, representation. Representation means a lot. You are marketing yourself as having 
these diverse individuals in leadership roles, which then translates to recruitment, retention, et cetera. And so I think there's a piece around representation. There's also diversity of thought, as we were talking about earlier. People from diverse lived experiences are going to come to experiences challenges, problems, opportunities with a different mindset and a different mind frame. And so I think there's tremendous benefit in terms of the thinking that can infuse and inspire. There's tremendous benefit in terms of representation and companies need to be equipped for how to then manage and balance that old school thinking and mentality, because often there is then a conflict even at that leadership level. And so it's going to take work, but it is a huge opportunity, I think, for the bottom line, for representation, for recruitment, for retention, and for diversity of solutions and potential innovation. But none of those things happen overnight. So it's not just hiring someone who checks the box and then everything is solved. These are workplace culture. These are workplace belief systems. These are ways of being. And that is a heavy lift that I think a lot of folks are not really prepared for how to lead. That was going to be my next question because you're highlighting very important benefits. But why do you think is the main reason we still see few women, women of color, non-binary and transgender leaders in the tech leadership roles and as startup founders still today? It's twofold. On the one hand, it's what is the benefit to the woman, right? What does it mean to sacrifice everything so that I can be the poster child for disrupting this whole space? How is that going to help me as an individual in my own life with my family, et cetera? I think a lot of it has to do with that. Like, what is the value back to the individual? And on the other hand, what is the appetite and the temperature and the climate of the organization in bringing those women in? It does no good whether it's women or gender diverse or ethnicity or racially diverse, whatever the identity is that you are checking your diversity boxes for, are they met with a culture of belonging, of welcoming, of engaging, of continued support or not? Because if you're going to hire all of these quote unquote, diverse people. And then you have a big wall up of a lack of inclusion and make it incredibly difficult for them to sustain their leadership and expertise, then of course they're going to leave, right? What is the value for them? It's two ways. What is the culture bringing them in? And what is the reward back to these individuals of diverse experiences? Because leadership is hard, especially at those high levels. You've got to be supported, sponsored, by your company, by other leaders, by other mentors, by teams, by the the written and unwritten rules of your organization and the field. Data reveals a concerning trend of low funding rates of startups led by women, with only one to two percent of the funding directed towards women in the tech industry. Black and Latino women in particular receive less than one percent. What factors do you believe contribute to this imbalance and what strategies can be activated to increase funding for women-led startups? This is a big and complex question. I believe that some of it has to do with early childhood socialization. We know in tech especially, there are a lot of research studies and data that reveal that men and particularly white men are socialized from a very early age as young boys to be more confident, take greater risks, be rewarded for greater failures, to believe that their abilities or their aspirations can be supported no matter how audacious they may be. And we know that this is not true for young women, and this is certainly not true for Black and Latino women in particular. So we know that they are systemic starting from early childhood. I believe that it's also sort of cycle where then as adults, we see fewer Black or Latina led startups, though that is changing to a degree. And I think some of what is changing are honestly these categories of women being fed up with this and starting their own organizations, their own VC firms, their own mentorship opportunities for entrepreneurship, you know, and really seeking out the peer guidance and the peer opportunities. And so I do see it starting to change very slowly with that women-led support. But I know that these are, again, systemic issues. 
And so we are products of our social environments. If we are raised and socialized to believe these self-limiting beliefs or ideas on top of other social issues, like the demands of having a family, of being a mother, pursuing tech careers or entrepreneurship and startup careers, it becomes, you know, quite layered. And so I think the imbalance starts early, continues on. And again, though, we're starting to see some shifts, it's going to take a lot more work. And I'll go back to sponsorship and male allyship. What about incubators that could be specifically for women or even women who are considering starting up, right? I think that bridge between like, I'm considering and I think I can do this to we want to recruit you so that you can be an entrepreneur in residence all of those opportunities tend to be quite male dominated and connected to a male experience. And based on everything you've said so far, how much do you think the tech industry has changed regarding the IP since you first joined? I think it's changed in vocabulary. You see a lot more efforts towards inclusion. You see a lot more communication on websites and people-led initiatives. I personally have been attracted to organizations who have these robust statements about their commitments to women in technology. But once you get there and you peek under the hood, you see some of the same patterns, right? You see male executives turning to female executives and asking them to take notes. You see male executives show up completely unprepared for critical stakeholder meetings when their female counterparts have not only been expected to do their homework, but then are critique about their performance in that moment. And so it's, you know, again, going back to social norms and the patriarchy, which is hundreds of years old. These social shifts, I don't think are going to happen overnight, but it takes a lot of concerted effort and agreement and commitment and reviewing, again, of company values, of organizational values, of personal values, of the leaders that are in specific organizations and within industries. So I think it's changed a lot in the language that's used, in the opportunity to review it, but I don't see a lot of change under the hood. And looking back on your career, what one thing would you have changed in your working environment to break the bias? I'm going to answer this slightly differently than what I would have changed and instead what I wish would have happened. It's not in terms of regrets, but it's only in hindsight that I see the pattern. I don't know that I actively would have had an opportunity, but we talked early about early childhood experiences, about where you grow up, about exposure to career opportunity, et cetera. Frankly, I never thought that entrepreneurship or a technical role were even a remote possibility. When I said my dream career was an astronaut, it's like, what is the farthest thing from my imagination and from my real experience that I could imagine? And like, that was the astronaut. Is that technically enabled? Absolutely. Is it male dominated? 100%. Is it pushing the envelope? Absolutely. Right. So I know that thinking was there, but there was not an opportunity for where I could see that in reality and how I might nurture that from a really early age. So, you know, I'm sometimes jealous a little bit, not that jealous is a strong word, envious maybe of young women now who are exposed to technology much earlier, who are exposed to advocacy for their own entrepreneurial adventures. And so I wish that would have been more commonplace when I was a young person. I think I probably would have studied different things. You know, it's neither here nor there. I, I bring great value to tech and to leadership because of the unique experience I have. But I really recognize how limiting that was based on my socioeconomic early experience. And that's just a common fact that a lot of people of diverse backgrounds, of intersectional backgrounds experience. I do feel the envyness that you're talking about because I come from the same generation that I also wish 
in existence back then. But looking forward, what actions will you take as a leader to reduce bias and improve the IEP for the next generation intake? Well, I get really passionate about this because I'm super committed to mentorship programs, to internship programs, to designing and evaluating them for different organizations in tech specifically and in entrepreneurship and startups specifically. So looking forward, I feel like it's my responsibility almost to reveal career pathways, to reveal career opportunities, to actively improve mentorship and guidance and internship opportunities for young people so that they can be exposed earlier to their own gifts, their own talents, their own strengths, and see, because who's going to show them? It's just expected that they know this, right? But to be able to see how those reveal themselves in a diversity of roles, right? Not everyone is necessarily good at or should be good at being a quote unquote tech leader. That's not for everyone. But to reveal the strengths of where either leadership or innovation or disruption might be happening because of someone's interest and innate skills and talents can be really exciting to consider multiple career opportunities and growth. And I see you really as the true role model and representation and educator for them coming. So let us move on to another hot topic in Business Day, which is work-life balance and mental health. Lauren, you've mentioned you have teenagers and you're working from home. And I'm sure you would know that you do have a busy lifestyle. How do you take care of yourself to maintain good mental health? I love this story. My own journey to mental health and a regular practice, I think it's the marriage of physical and mental health for me personally, came when I dislocated my elbow during COVID in the winter after being completely fatigued and working, I don't know, probably 18 hours a day, getting a mobile app out the door, just that, you know, exhilaration of committed, you know, all of those nostalgic and sort of semi-romantic stories of tech teams that work through the night with two boxes of pizza. That was my remote, albeit, life in creating an app and I took a break to go snowboarding with my family and I wasn't doing anything exciting. I didn't even get on the lift yet. I was just buckled, strapped in and gliding down towards the lift. And as I recall, the mental health and balance gods and the universe literally yanked me down into the ground. I dislocated my elbow. I was forced to commit to my physical and mental health. And the recovery was quite difficult because it was COVID. I was, you know, just elbow locked for a long time before I could see a therapist. But what got me out of it was the commitment with hot yoga. And I did practice yoga before that, but I have become much more serious and much more committed to my own development in those experiences. I have some wonderful yoga instructors that have been absolutely inspirational and I have some forthcoming content, in fact, about leadership and even the similarities and parallels with being a committed yoga student and being a product leader in tech. All of the reminders of the importance of breathing, the importance of believing you can do hard things, of finite time and maximizing that time with a really good structure. You know, so some really interesting trends that I have reflected on since that time and through my continued practice. But that is one of my favorite outlets, along with just regularly getting outside, living in Salt Lake City and being in a very active outdoor environment is super helpful for that balance. I'm sorry to hear about your accident. I hope you are well now. Yeah, fully recovered. Glad to hear. But before that, have you ever experienced burnout? And if you did, how did you end up tackling it? Yeah, I do experience burnout. I'm a really passionate person. I care a lot about the work I do and the people that I work with. I am at risk of burnout frequently. I regularly have to check myself, you know, 
scheduling vacation, regular intervals, again, going back to yoga, you cannot sustain the most difficult and increasing difficult positions forever. There has to be a rest and recovery moment. And so being able to schedule those on regular intervals that are not necessarily dictated by my work schedule that are just, this is what we're going to do at this time with my family or by myself is a really important pattern. You know, that rest recovery, stepping completely away on the weekends often, right? That whole meme of slams your computer shut until Monday. There are other times where I balance my lifestyle and balance burnout by reducing my hours during the week and picking up on the weekend if there, you know, is a busy time with my family. And that's part of why I really advocate for and absolutely love leaders who promote true remote first, people first work, truly trusting their teams to not only execute, but execute well on their requirements and their demands and giving that freedom to work through your own schedule. It's, you know, one thing to carelessly miss client meeting or stakeholder meeting. It's another thing to require someone to be handcuffed to a desk or a computer screen from nine to five for no good reason, right? Just to say that you're monitoring them, that's just absolutely ridiculous. And so I think those really contribute to managing burnout. And that's really, you know, how I do it is owning my schedule and intentionally blocking best practice in tech is time blocking. You commit to something and time blocking those vacations, those moments to step away, time with family, dinner with friends, reunions with former colleagues and working out. Great. It seems that you have a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge. So what is your advice to companies how to create a more mentally healthy workplace in the new now going forward? I think you have to model it. You cannot say with words, this is important to us. And then you don't see people do it. That's sending the wrong message. Not everyone has the same mental health patterns or practice that help them be well, right? They might look different for lots of people, but I think regularly and actively championing and advocating for them. And there are really fun things in remote first, completely distributed teams that you can do. We do often health challenges or workplace challenges where we work in technology. There's no shortage of apps now where you can track and promote and celebrate your own commitment and your team's commitment to uh, healthy lifestyles. You shared with us what you love about your role, your film, and working in the tech industry. But what would you say motivates you every day to get out of bed? Honestly, it's my kids. And it's interesting because it both motivates and also completely exhausts me. <laughs> It is hard to be a parent these days, and it is extremely hard, in my opinion, to be a parent of teenagers. And so my honest motivation as an achiever myself is to get up and achieve and get things done ahead of my kids and the family dynamic. And when I feel more in control and more prepared, which is also part of the bedtime routine, right? It's like what motivates you to get to bed at a decent hour? What motivates you to curate a balanced, calm, complete environment so that you can be motivated to get up in the morning, right? It's all part of a connected package. And so my kids absolutely motivate me to get up out of bed every day and to make sure I get enough rest also. Beautiful. Now, let us wrap up with a few words of wisdom and a piece of advice for listeners. Lauren, what is the best piece of advice you've been given that has helped you during setbacks in your role and career? Everything has a season and nothing is permanent and forever. So as devastating as any setback may be, be it a layoff, be it a challenging relationship with a boss, be it a challenging client or a personally challenging moment in your life that affects your career, none of it is permanent. So remembering just like the garden that everything has a season and sometimes it's a whole season of being furloughed 
right? You just need to let the soil heal. You can come back and have a beautiful turnaround to a beautiful new garden with a complete new map of nutrients and flowers and blooming and health. Beautiful metaphor. And then what is the worst advice you ever received in your career and how did you handle it? The worst advice is something around like, just keep your nose to the grind, just keep quiet and keep working or whatever kind of advice is related to just silencing or brushing something under the rug or neglecting an issue that is maybe related to someone's values. I think it is the absolute worst thing to ignore value misalignment, be it in an organization or in a product that you're working on or with a team. If there is a value misalignment, it is only going to result in resentment and frustration. And I really do believe the worst advice is to just quietly accept it and persist. There's no reason that we should be unhappy in the space where we spend more hours away from our family. And though it may be, quote unquote, doing the thing we love and therefore not work, it will always be work if there is misalignment. So it's not coming from a place of love if that is the case. And based on everything you said, looking back in your career, is there something you wish you would have known or a skill you wish you had when starting out in the tech industry? This goes back to early socialization. I think we do a real disservice to young women, especially, but anyone in general to accept that someone is quote unquote, not good at math or not good at science or doesn't like math or doesn't like science. I think those are super dangerous mindsets because though you may not see it as a young person, things like being able to advocate for your own promotion based on metric-driven impact, that is the way that someone will advance. And if you don't know math, you can't get your metrics, right? And so I think maybe wish that I were able to see kind of impact-driven analytics and get really comfortable with that much sooner in my career. I think it would have done a lot for me, but I don't have regrets because I do it and advocate for it now. And if you had the ability to go back in time to where you were just at the beginning of your career, what advice would you give to your younger self? It sounds so cliche, but something like the older version of you is going to be so proud. Oh, that's so beautiful. And what advice will you give to young girls, women, women of color, non-binary and transgenders who are trying to break into STEM fields today, especially wanting to become next generation leaders? Absolutely find your inspiration, not just in the tool or the innovation that they are delivering, but in the kind of person they are and how they show up in the world of work. And I think it's critical to find women that are doing this. There are unique issues, setbacks, constraints, experiences that women have that no matter how good the male mentor may be and no matter how much they intend to support, it does not come from a place of a shared experience and women, especially young women, need that. Last but not least, Lauren, what is next for you in your role and career in tech? What are your career aspirations? My career aspirations are to move into the C-suite. I love the intersection of work, of learning, and of technology. And this can take many forms depending on the dynamic of individuals in an organization, depending on the product, depending on its impact. So I'm looking for that level of advancement to be able to be the representation as a tech leader for other young women. Beautiful. I look forward to following your journey. Thank you very much, Lauren, for being a guest on the Quiz Up Tech podcast, sharing your journey, your knowledge, your experiences, your passion. We, without a doubt, inspire and reshape company culture for the next generation of women, women of color, non binary, and transgender leaders in tech. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. If you have worked in the tech industry a minimum of three years and would like to share your journey, please nominate yourself or somebody you know to i at jasminemoradi.com. 
For more podcast episodes and to learn more about the Queens of Tech initiative and to support us, visit queensof.tech.